thank you all for showing up. Um, thank you to the GWSS Works in Progress series for allowing me to present this work. It very much is a work in progress. I have not shared these ideas um, yet uh, in any sort of forum. So I'm looking forward to your feedback and your suggestions for improvement. The topic is sexual creepiness. I'm going to begin by arguing that uh, as a moral category, sexual creepiness is in tension with liberal and progressive values. And in the second part of the talk, I'm going to give a diagnosis of what I think the purpose or at least the service that sexual creepiness currently serves is. So let's begin. Um, an interesting fact is that it seems like sexual creepiness as an accusation, at least, is on the rise. Uh, there, Google does not keep track of uses of sexual creepiness. It doesn't, you know, show up that often. Usually people just use the word creepy. And as you see, there's been a big spike in usage of the word creepy uh, starting in the late 80s, 90s. Um, I'm guessing that almost all of those are sexual creepiness. So uh, I don't think, you know, people are talking about, you know, like haunted houses, or I don't think there's been some big resurgence of Gothic literature or something like that. So I'm guessing that uh, the common impression that people have that um, the word sexual cre creepiness comes up a lot is on the increase. Maybe this is because people are getting more creepy. And uh, I certainly accept that as, as happening, but there's more interesting things happening than just that. Um, there's not a lot written on uh, creepiness, let alone very little written on sexual creepiness. Uh, some of the stuff written on creepiness talks about sexual creepiness. Um, there's a just a handful of philosophy articles that kind of even touch on the issue. Um, and not much written, not much more written in psychology. A locus classicus uh, of it, uh, of the whole literature, is the 2015 essay on the nature of creepiness by psychologists Francis McAndrew and Sarah Konke. And it's a nice study, big, uh, international. And uh, they just, you know, asked people. Uh, on a lot of dimensions, you know, what's creepy? Uh, professions, uh, as you might expect, being a clown, a taxidermist, a sex shop owner. These are some professions that were viewed as particularly creepy. Um, hobbies, I like collecting, especially dolls or body parts, <laughs> are viewed as creepy. Uh, even just hobbies that involved watching seems like uh watching like bird watching even was viewed as creepy um certain physical traits are creepy like greasy hair bulging eyes being tall being skinny being really uh light, white um having long fingers having long fingernails those are viewed as creepy traits Behaviors uh, would include things like steering conversations to sex uh, very early in your discussion with the, the person you just met, staring at a person or watching a person for a long time before interacting with them, avoiding eye contact with them while you're interacting with them, kind of just generally being shifty looking, um, things like that, touching, touching their arm, uh, it's like too quickly and being too familiar physically or being too close to them. Um, McAndrew and Konke conclude that the essence of creepiness is what they call ambiguous threateningness. And they think this analysis does a good job of explaining why men are judged to be creepy far more often than women are. Why, uh, especially men with weird hobbies are viewed as creepy. Why presentations that involve masked appearance tend to be creepy, like being a clown. And why young reproductive age women are more likely to categorize someone as creepy because they are the most um, common target of sexual interest. So uh, you might think like just applying the view mechanically to the question of sexual creepiness, if creepiness 
is ambiguous threat, then sexual creepiness is ambiguous sexual threat. And that's what uh, McAndrew does. Uh, he, he has a Psychology Today blog. And in one nice post that he has um, that um, um, I even assigned this to my class, How to Avoid Creeping Women Out. He, I'm just going to read uh, parts of it. It's quite informative for what we're going to talk about. Let's face it, he says, it does not take very much for a guy to look like a creep. Women, on the other hand, really have to show you something spectacular before the word creepy is used to describe them. Women almost, I just got to move some stuff out of it. Women almost universally reported the feeling that a guy, that the guy in question had some sort of sexual interest in them and that this was not perceived as harmless or flattering. Women are simply at greater risk for sexual assault and the costs of this are potentially greater for them. And so they must be especially vigilant about sexual threats. And hence they are more likely to fear that a guy may not just be a creep, but a pervert as well, he writes. The word creep and pervert are often used interchangeably, but I would like to make a distinction. Guys can be creepy for a variety of reasons that are unrelated to sexuality. But I propose that a pervert is a creep who sets off alarm bells because he poses some sort of sexual threat. In other words, a pervert has sex on his mind and is probably, it's probably sex that's unusual, deviant, and possibly dangerous. And then he gives uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, the serial killer, as an example. At least part of a pervert's creepiness may sometimes be traced to his assumption that his perverse desires are secretly shared by his potential victim. Some men are greater risk than others in social situations, he says. He talks about parties briefly. Good-looking men with strong social skills can typically get away with a lot more than awkward guys with unusual and less attractive physical traits. Other demographic variables, such as age and race, well, may also play a role. Okay, the trope of the dirty old man, for instance, exists for a reason. So he writes that um, it is no just make it, this thing. it is no secret that as men age, they retain an attraction towards much younger women. But at some point, an age difference becomes so great that a romantic approach often tosses the man directly into the creep bin. In fact, Christian Rudder, the founder of OKCupid, okay uh, developed the standard creepiness rule to help men avoid looking like creeps, and that's the half their age plus seven rule. Now, um, so much for some of the psychology on creepiness. Let's talk about whether, let's turn to ethics for a bit and ask whether this is compatible with liberal and progressive values as applied to sex or liberal or progressive sexual values. Um, to just fix terms a bit, um, when I say liberalism, I mean liberalism as a sort of political theorist might use the, the phrase as uh, it's more often used in Europe. By liberal uh, liberalism, I mean um, an ideology that puts primacy uh, behind freedom, okay? Hence the name liber liberalism and equality, as well as uh, uh, probably the main sort of left liberal thinker put it, liberals seek the maximum individual liberty compatible with equal liberty for others. Progressivism is more to the left than liberalism. It is more committed than liberalism is to uh, equality of outcomes, you know, which they often call equity. Uh, demarginalization and inclusion of minorities or outsiders. Um, using government and uh, changing institutional cultures, in other words, using power to achieve these outcomes. They're much more comfortable with doing that than the liberal will be, typically. Right. So given that, um, we come to a very interesting Aeon article by law professor Heidi Matthews. She wrote this a few years ago and it went viral, rightfully so. It's a really good article. And Matthews just sort of takes us to task for using 
the word creepy to describe people. She's not a big fan of sort of the norm, the creepiness norm, all right, imposed upon our culture. So she, she begins her essay by pointing to some other psychological evidence I did not discuss, that uh, female subjects, uh, female college students, don't uh, really reliably pick out dangerous men. So like, for instance, this one, this one study, you know, showed women a bunch of faces from America's most wanted and then just regular, regular guys. And like, they didn't, they didn't do a very good job of like picking out the, the actually dangerous men. That's not a really good study. I mean, it doesn't show you a lot. There may be, um, you know, maybe you have to be sort of in situ to, to really tell that somebody is creepy. You know, you can't tell from just a mugshot uh, how creepy they are. But um, so, so much for that. She, she just is skeptical that, that uh, our so-called spidey sense for creepiness is very good. As she puts it, so rather than reliably detecting danger, our internal spidey sense often signals social difference or otherness because what the men who keep getting called creepy tend to be ugly men and weird men, okay? Uh, when we judge a situation or person creepy, we participate in, she writes, shunning and social ostracism. Creepiness can prevent us from responding to the odd, the new, or the peculiar with curiosity, interest, and generosity of spirit. This is something a good progressive would say. This is openness to experience. This is uh, highly egalitarian. This is not interested in othering people. This is interested in not stigmatizing um, um, the weird, the disabled, etc. As researchers warn, what most people intuit to be creepy aligns closely with the attributes of individuals and populations already or on or beyond the boundaries of social acceptance. The mentally ill and disabled, the physically deformed, those with tics or other abnormal movements or facial features, like maybe Tourette's, the impoverished and the homeless are all more likely to be judged creepy empirically. This is true. But if we allow creepiness to stand in for principled normative assessment of the kinds of sex we want to hold up as socially valuable, she writes, it will be at the expense of historically and sexually marginalized groups, the queers, the perverts, the BDSM community. Remember all this talk of perverts, right? That McAnd McAndrews was talking about. And others who find joy and meaning in the sexually experimental. Perhaps instead of spending so much energy excluding creeps, we should all turn our gaze inward and ask, in the words of Radiohead, am I a creep? I'm a weirdo. What the hell am I doing here? So in sum then, the liberal or progressive case against creepiness is going to go as so. It's an unreliable detector of sexual threat. I mean, if, if sure, you know, the creepy are somewhat maybe likely, you know, to be um, um, sexually dangerous, okay, but, you know, is that enough to, like, shun them or treat them differently? I mean, think of, think of what per liberals and progressives think of, say, racial profiling, which operates by the same logic, okay? Um, it's sexist. Um, if, if we apply the normal thing, the normal criteria of what counts as a slur to this, it is clearly a male slur. Um, it's very hard to get uh, someone to call a woman creepy. It's ageist. It condemns old men seeking relationships with younger women. It's lookist. Uh, it morally stigmatizes uh, people for uh, mere bad looks. It stigmatizes the neurodivergent uh, people, especially people who are um, on the autism spectrum. Um, it is not sex positive if you're into sex positivity, as, as many liberals and progressives are. Um, it stigmatizes consensual sexual unions and activities, um, such as kinks. So as we'll talk about later, you know, a lot of the use of, of sexual, a lot of accusations of sexual creepiness are directed towards people who actually are in a relationship with someone else, right? So if if Jack is with Jill, Jill doesn't see him to be particularly creepy, but Jack will get called creepy in a lot of these situations, right? So it's what's going on there. Um, and it's not uh, sex liberal 
in the sense that it treats sexual approach or sexual proposition as scary or different from other sorts of social interaction, like, hey, would you like to get a pizza or, you know, something like that, um, which uh, you actually do hear um, a lot of sex educators who consider themselves in this, uh, you know, liberal or casual sex tradition of, uh, you know, like the correct view of sex is just it's like some any other sort of activity that um, should be consensual. So, um, so what should we do? What should liberals, what, what should liberals or progressives do? Now, this isn't really particularly my problem. I'm not a progressive or a liberal myself, but, uh, you know, um, most of you are. Um, so, you know, uh, I want to hear what you guys have to say about it, but, um, you know, just thinking on your behalf, you know, you wonder, well, what, what, what should the liberal or progressive say? And, you know, if you're Matthews, it's like, well, so much for creepiness. But I think, I think we could maybe complicate it a little bit, uh, try to try to rescue creepiness for the progressive and liberal a little bit um, with this sort of line of thought. Um, it is, after all, sometimes okay to act or even maintain a, a, a social practice that's at odds with your values if the costs of getting rid of that practice is just too high. So for instance, touching Touching people without consent is in tension with liberalism. Like, you know, if you're a good liberal, you shouldn't just be, you know, just touching people without their consent. You shouldn't, you shouldn't be touching their, especially their sexual organs without, without consent. I think that's fair to say. But uh, there's this problem of babies. Right? So babies need their diapers changed. And uh, hugging, hugging your kids, you know, just normal people hug their kids. And normal people take their kids to grandma or grandpa's house, uncles and aunt's house and, and say, you know, well, hug your aunt and hug, you know, Aunt Betty and so forth. And maybe Aunt Betty smells a little bit or whatever, but she's still hug her and we, we just you know, kind of shoo, shoo our kids to Aunt Betty and have them hug her. That's just normal people. And most of you probably do that too. Um, but there is a movement out there. I mean, you could go on on YouTube and uh, find lots of people with videos about why it is problematic to just go and hug your kid. Um, you should ask permission to hug your kid. Is it okay if I hug you to sort of teach them this consent culture? All right. Uh, but most of us aren't like that. All right. It's just it's just too costly, and uh, just somehow we, we we just don't worry about that. So. Um, it is sometimes okay to do this, even if it's at odds with the with your overall uh, moral ideology. Um, a practice can, after all, include norms because norms are a type of practice. Social norms are a type of social practice. So it it follows then that the norms governing accusations of creepiness um, might be acceptable to liberals and progressives if the costs of abandoning them are too high. All right. So that leads us to part two. Do, in fact, the norms governing accusations of sexual creepiness serve some important function? Do they at least, if, you, if you're leery of function talk, do they at least serve a valuable purpose? Well, um, I think they might. Uh, it's for you to judge. Um, Probably the major function they serve is what I'll call pre-filtering. All right. So um, the pre-filtering hypothesis goes like this: young women have always and everywhere been the primary target of sexual tension. That's just always going to be the case. Um, traditional societies have a variety of measures to filter out substandard suitors and sexual and unwanted sexual proposition. All right. So um, most traditional cultures have what might be called chaperone cultures, right? Just young girls and young women just don't, uh, you know, uh, you know, 15, 16 to whatever, till they get married, just don't really kind of go out alone. They go out with their sisters or some family member or some brother or something like that. Um, they don't just, you know, go with boys alone in cars and stuff like that. Um, arranged marriages, of course, right? So if um, if you're a substandard suitor and you're trying to, you know, 
court some girl, you have to kind of talk to the parent, the parents filter you out. Um, and uh, the good girl, bad girl distinction, which is very liberal, very progressive, because it's very inegalitarian. Um, also uh, worked mightily at helping uh, this because, you know, you could approach a prostitute, um, you know, with direct sexual proposition or something like that, but you can't, you know, approach a good girl like that. You don't talk to a good girl or a respectable, respectable girl like that. So respectable, respectable girls weren't being, respectable girls weren't being propositioned willy-nilly sexually. Uh, monogamy also serves to reduce pressure on young women because um, most men uh, by time, you know, in, in their 30s, late 20s or 30s will, uh, and beyond would be married in, in a monogamous culture, not a polygamous culture. And um, they're off the market uh, because it's a monogamous culture. So one of the features of a, one of the downsides of a polygamous culture is that because the uh, unmarried men are going after the young women, but also the married men are going after the young women because they're trying to pick up a second wife, a third wife. Um, there's just this unrelenting, this sort of unrelenting uh, pressure from all ages of men on, on young women. And this has uh, various sorts of predictable social effects in polygamous cultures like um, reintroducing chaperone culture, bride price, um, you know, more rape. Um, uh, parents want to marry off the girls younger, so the age of first marriage goes down, etc. Um, but those days are gone, right? Those norms have been replaced. And um, so what we have is an introduction of a more liberal sex ethic, which introduces, well, just like liberalism applied to the marketplace, right, is an unregulated uh, marketplace for goods, Right, it's 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 generally antithetical to a lot of regulation on the marketplace. Um, hence, like libertarianism with regard to you know free markets and stuff like that. Um, an unregulated sexual marketplace means that there aren't you know these tra these traditional filters to to put it in the vernacular of of the my students. You know, you get to shoot your shot. You know, you get to. You get you see you see someone you get to proposition them to go out with them or you know express your interest in them or something more sexual. So um, you could think about like hawking culture in uh, a lot of some some cities in the first world, but you see this a lot in the third world of you know just people approaching your car, approaching you as you're walking down the sidewalk and trying to sell you something. That's that's an unregulated market, and um, you know there's really nothing to say against it. They are, you're, you're free to decline, but they are free to propose um, selling you, you know, whatever it is, this box of crackers or whatever. And uh, applied to sex means that, you know, pe that people are free to propose, uh, you know, some sort of sexual relationship with you and you're free to decline. Of course, it's burdensome to go down these places to go, you know, to, to be stuck in traffic and have these people coming to you, knocking on your window, to be walking down the sidewalk and having, you know, being constantly solicited to. Um, progressive sex ethics uh, has somewhat different angle on this, right? Um, you could see why a progressive sex ethic leads to more feelings of mate equity, um, right? There's this idea that, well, no one is too good for me. No one is out of my league. What's this league business, right? We're not in the business of leagues. Right? Everyone's in the same league. Um, so um, I shouldn't feel like anyone is out of my league. Some, some attractive girl should not feel like she's out of anyone's league or too good for anybody if she's really internalized these, these norms. Um, one of the most important sex, ethic, uh, uh, sex ethics essay written in the last decade was by Amia uh, Srinivasan, uh, her right to sex. Um, also the title of a book you know, that she, uh, the four essays. And uh, that, that essay, if you read it, you know that it's about this question about, well, you know, people like heaping scorn on incels for being resentful and frustrated that, um, you know, people aren't having sex with them. But um, a lot of people in, you know, she's 
talking to you know progressives and liberals here, mostly her readership. Um, you know, but yeah, progressives and liberals, you know, feel some sympathy towards um, trans women who uh, are also, you know, kind of being excluded from the mating market. And, um, you know, a lot of trans activists argue that it's transphobic not, uh, to date a uh, female woman, but not a trans woman. And so um, she's like, well, you know, that's sort of inconsistent. Do we have to be easier on the incels? And then she has a whole spiel about that. Um, so you see that uh, that's a real dynamic that they're working out. So, um, so much for the social norms changing. There's also, of course, uh, rapid changes in technology over that same uh, window of where, you know, the use of the word creepy has shot up. We see that um, phones and social media, dating apps, more and more uh, young women are trying to make money on the side on with OnlyFans, which maybe usually doesn't make them much money, but um, does expose them to a lot of very undiluted raw sexual proposition. Okay, so, um, you know, even if you're not trying to send out those signals uh, and you're a teenage girl, like almost, like very typically all my female students will say they've been sent unsolicited dick pics. And you have, you know, guys you don't even know on the other side of the earth, you know, contacting you on social media, you know, s saying, you know, send me bobs and vagina, you know, um, and so forth. Um, you have fewer married men. And more of the married men are poly or identify as poly. Um, so we see, you know, so here are some some declines in, in uh, marriage rates. Um, this is this was a amusing viral Reddit post from a woman who uh, had an open started an open relationship with her husband and uh, quickly fell in with her fitness uh, instructor and um, and uh, got fed up with her husband because she in part because she found out that he was hitting on 19 year old girls and she even though he was 36 and she, she judged that to be creepy um there's you know and if you if you look at women's magazines talking about creepiness um, you'll see things that sound very unprogressive very liberal like um this one there is an under you know so what makes you creepy there's an understanding in life i like that phrase like it's, that's that's like we're, we're about to take a little departure from our normal morality there is an understanding in life that most people date others who are within their own league in other words a supermodel would not date an ugly guy so if a guy thinks he can have any woman he wants and he's not attractive then that is creepy he has a sense of entitlement and thinks that he can have anyone he wants, but it's not true. Now, this is a bit disingenuous. I mean, this author is trying to make it sound like he thinks like that there's entitlement here or that he thinks he could get any woman he wants. I don't think any guy thinks he could get any woman he wants. Okay. Um, but if he's a, if he really has internalized progressive values, he should indeed think like um, there's no one out of his league in the sense of, you know, um, he has every right to, to, to approach uh, anyone he wants. Okay, and so um, to bring that together, then the pre-filtering hypothesis says that since being labeled creepy is reputationally costly for a man, it behooves young women to have a norm in which substandard suitors, even if not being creepy, abort their own would-be solicitations, which would reduce pressure on young women. So just, you know, they they abort their approach before they even bother the young woman so she doesn't have to keep rejecting him or saying no. Um, this seems to work. Uh, it seems to work perhaps too well. Um, a lot of my male students will tell you that they are really afraid of coming off creepy if they just approach a girl and ask her out in any sort of polite way. Um, maybe they're wrong about it, but they are freaked out about it. Um, this is a un un somewhat unscientific poll by a dating coach, but um, these numbers sound right to me. The majority of American men, 70% say fear of being labeled creepy impacts how they interact with women. And almost half of American men say fear of being labeled creepy reduces the likelihood that they interact with women romantically or otherwise. So it works. All right. 
The second part of this, less important perhaps, is what I'll call the redirection hypothesis. It begins by noting that lots of accusations of sexual creepiness are what we could call third-party accusations. Uh, Jill is not creeped out by Jack, and you know maybe she likes Jack, but observers still label Jack as being creepy for having pursued Jill because of some feature about, about Jack. Um, so for instance, um, as many of you know, Leonardo DiCaprio has this reputation for um, dating women between 20 and 24, no matter how old he gets. Although I think now he is dating someone who's like 27 uh, or 29 or something like that. Um, and there was a bit of a campaign a few months ago to call him creepy. So you had, you had some journalists um, and some celebrities, you know, call him creepy. And you could almost see like there was a sort of social attempt to like brand him as creepy. It, it seems to have been unsuccessful. He's just too good looking and too rich and too attractive. So he's uh, kind of immune. Um, but it was attempted. Um, so even though all those women on his yacht want to be there, even though his girlfriends evidently like him enough to be his girlfriends, um, um, we still somehow feel free or a lot of people feel free to call someone creepy who's doing that. Um, a lot of, I, I just found out a few days ago that it seems like a lot of polyamorous men are called creepy. Um, Again, if they are actually in, like even people who are in polyamorous relationships, so clearly whoever they're in a relationship with finds it to be okay, right? But you have third parties um, condemning these guys as creepy. So the, this redirection hypothesis suggests like, well, look, plaus plausibly this part of the creepiness norm, right? Who is getting accused of creepiness? is about redirecting male interest in some way the third party accuser favors. So accusing older male partners of being creepy discourages other older men from hitting on younger women. So you won't get Leonardo DiCaprio to stop, but you may get that guy in your neighborhood to stop. And it shames younger women, maybe not a uh, uh, you know, Hollywood starlet that would date Leonardo DiCaprio or some model, but you could maybe shame a girl on your block um, from, um, hooking up with or um, having a relationship with uh, an older man that she's otherwise potentially interested in. So this serves to redirect um, other than other eligible older men to older women, which is good for older women. Older women uh, accusing polyamorous men of being creepy discourages men from pursuing polyamory. And shames poly women interested in such men, which redirects people to monogamy, which is good for those perhaps who uh, compete better in monogamous mating economies, or um, it satisfies people who uh, you know are pro monogamy, um, you know just because they think it's better socially, like uh, like me. So, in conclusion. Uh, I suggest that sexual creepiness, um, either itself, the moral category itself, or at least the norms around accusations of it, because those could be different, right? So um, like there's a, a moral category of injustice, say. And, and, that, and injustice like of all moral categories, no one's gonna have a problem with. But if for some reason like, the only people who were being called unjust were like black people, then you'd be like, okay, maybe I'm cool with injustice, but like, why are we just calling black people unjust, right? So it's the way that norm is being used, right? It's the way that moral category is being used that is an interesting norm. Or like, let's suppose that you had like, like it suppose like only young women pretty much we're calling only black people unjust. And you'd be like, okay, now I'm, now I'm really not, now I'm starting to get really concerned about this moral norm or at least how it's being deployed. Um, so sexual creepiness either itself is a moral category or at least the norms around accusations of it is in tension with liberal and progressive sexual values. But maybe it is all told justifiable even to liberals and progressives if, if, it serves an important social good. 
I hypothesize that good uh, is that it relieves sexual burdens on young women created by technology plus a decline of sexual mores, of traditional sexual mores, and that it redirects men in ways that accusers find socially or personally beneficial. For instance, uh, redirecting older men uh, towards older women uh, um, and uh, maybe redirecting uh, po polyamorous to uh, monogamous lifestyles. Um, so that's the talk. Thank you very much.